Well, this morning we're going to speak of faith and the importance of faith. I guess uh, when you see the first scripture that I'm going to use, you would know what the sermon was about right away. But uh, this is something that we all need more of, isn't it? Faith. And we're going to talk about what it is and, and some of the things that it does this morning. As we get into our lesson here this morning, let's uh, go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And we'll start right out with the first verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things which are not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. As we look at verse 1, uh, I have a question for you, and that is, is this verse 1, is that the definition of the word faith? I've heard preachers say that it was, and I don't think it exactly is. I think it's more of a statement of what faith is and what faith does than the definition of the word faith. But what would be a definition of the word faith? Well, we could go to Webster and he says that it's a belief or trust in a higher power or being. Well, it's all right, but it's not enough, is it? And when we with Christians, how we use faith, we use it a little differently than that. It's more than that. Uh, well, my Bible, my reference Bible, gives a definition of faith. It says the essence of faith consists of believing and receiving what God has revealed and may be defined as trust in God and the scriptures in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, which receives him as Lord and Savior and impels to do obedience and good works. Too complicated. Too complicated. And there's things in there that go beyond faith. Let's keep it simple. Let's just tell you what, how it works. Faith. It's take what God says, believe it, and live your life like you believed it. That's what it is. Find out what God is saying to you. Believe it and live your life like you believed it. And that's the important part. When I look at these heroes of the faith here in Hebrews 11, they did exactly that. They lived like they believed it. And that's the important thing that we should do too. Now, we have in this passage, we have a related illustration here in verse 3. And what did verse 3 here say? It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God and that the things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. Well, we could take the scientific approach to that, but we won't. Uh, do you believe in creation? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that everyone here does. Of course you do. You know, Romans 1, uh, 1 20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, it's talking about God here, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And of course, in the passage in Romans, Paul is talking about the fact that much of the world has turned away from God. They've made their own gods. They're worshiping other things. And uh, he's saying here that God's creation proves that God is and that God created it. We have assurance. We can see the evidence. And we do. We see creation and we see the complexity of creation. And uh, we realize that with this complexity of creation, it had to be created. It couldn't have just happened. It could not have just happened. And uh, the unbeliever looks and says, oh, this just happened. There we are. What is this? Uh, it just took millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And here it is. Yeah. Well, did you ever think about the fact that the day after the rapture, there won't be very many people here on earth that believe that God created it? Now, some of them may change their mind before it's all over. But that's an interesting thing, that creation is so important 
And we see that Satan knows where to hit hard. Uh, why is it that he came up, you know, even science, you know, we have the theory of evolution. The only reason they call it a theory is because they tried to bring it out back in the 20s and 30s and there were still enough Christians around, they raised a fuss. And so they said, well, we'll call it a theory. But of course, they don't teach it like a theory, they teach it like fact. And if you don't get to get it right on the test, why, you're going to flunk. So that's a little different than a theory, but that's the way it is. So the unbeliever has his ideas on how it just happened and what just happened. Now it says in verse one here that faith is substance. Now it's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now let's start out by getting hope right. Uh, the substance of things hoped for. And uh, last week or last time I spoke, I gave you a, a little definition, a biblical definition of the word hope in the scripture. The assurance of that which must come to pass based on the promise of God who cannot lie. And uh, that's, it's a positive thing. We, when we hope, we don't just hope we get the bicycle for Christmas, you know. Uh, I wouldn't want one, but some of you may. But uh, anyway, we, uh, we find that it's, um, that when the scripture, our hope in the scripture is that which we know is going to happen. It's just, we don't like to wait for it. And uh, that's uh, the way it uh, was when we were kids, wasn't it? But anyway, it says, talks about evidence here. What is the evidence? How is hope evidence? Well, you've all, we all heard preachers probably say uh, that uh, this word means a title deed. And I, I never, I always wondered about that. Heart, when I was had young people's group, Howard Hendricks had some tapes that we used and they talked about, uh, he talked about the help is the title deed that what you got. I never really related to it. It never really worked good. I got into it though. It is related to the word in the Greek. The word there, hope is related to a word in the Greek that has to do with a title or a deed. And more interesting in Latin, it is the word hope. So if you were speaking Latin, and I never was good at it, but if you were speaking Latin, why, you know, you would say, well, I own this piece of property and I have the hope for it. And being the hope, meaning the word deed. And uh, so it's kind of the way those the words work. But anyway, it makes unseen things visible. It's the proof that we've got. It's what God has given us for the proof. And uh, we see that the promises of the land of Canaan that were given to the patriarchs, they were real. And we see that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and even Daniel to some extent there, they all believed that God had given them that land that they were wandering around in, but they never had it. But if we look in Hebrews, this same page here, Hebrews eleven thirteen, it says, these all died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So all of these who had this hope, all of these that were wandering around, they had faith that God was going to give them that land. Uh, they all died in the faith. Uh, the verse tells, tells us that these people considered themselves to be pilgrims and strangers here on earth. And uh, we see that, uh, that they were. Uh, it says, uh, as we go on to verse 14, uh, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return, but they desired a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is, is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So it's pointing out here that the country, if they wanted to go back to the country that they came from as a homeland, they could have done that. They had that opportunity, but they desired a better, a much better place, a heavenly, a heavenly country. Um, and it says then, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Isn't that a wonderful thing to say about somebody? Oh, if God 
only said, you know, about, about us, it, he's not ashamed to be called our God. And wonderful thing that he says about these patriarchs and these heroes of the faith here. But it goes on, it gets even better. It says, for God has prepared them or has prepared a city for them. And uh, so they had a wonderful thing coming, didn't they? All of these were wanderers. They all died without getting there. Was, was their faith valid? Oh yes, their faith was valid because they're gonna send, spend eternity in that city that God is going to make for them. Now, what foundation do we have for our hope? What do we have? Well, it's all in the faithfulness of God's promises, isn't it? And that's a wonderful thing, God's promises. Now, if there is no God, or if his promises aren't true, then it's, it's all for nothing, isn't it? But there is a God and his promises are true. And we have eternity in heaven to gain by it. We can be thankful there. All right, then where does faith come from? Well, Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by hearing, all right, but not just hearing any old thing. It comes by hearing the word of God. It comes by letting that word develop within us. And that's, that's an important thing to consider. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But we are talking about the word of God. We're talking about what's in this book. Uh, you know, we often feel like that father in the ninth chapter of the book of Mark. Uh, he had brought his son there to, the, to Christ and Christ wasn't there when he got here, got when when they got there. But this son of his, he had what he what is called here a mute spirit. And when he asked uh, the disciples, they couldn't do anything about it. But then Jesus came and he asked Jesus to have compassion on us and help us. And what did Jesus say? He said, All things are possible to him who believes. And then we often, even as his father, we cry out as he did and say, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And of course the Lord did and the Lord healed his son and the Lord will help us through these times. When we wonder and worry, we need to go to him. We may be weak believers, but through the knowledge of what he says in his word, our faith will become stronger and stronger. And uh, as we said, God's word is not just any word. God's word, uh, well, he's given it a special operating system, hasn't he? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, he's even given his word life. You're all familiar with this verse, but let's look at uh, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Oh, we don't sometimes give God's word the credit it should have. It is living. It is more than just another book. It's quite descriptive, this verse, of what, it, what it's all about. Uh, we, we think of it here. Uh, it's living. It's powerful beyond what we even believe. It's sharper than we can imagine. Of course, these are descriptive words used back then for uh, people that knew what these things were, a sword, for instance. Uh, but we find that it can divide the soul and the spirit from one another. You know, that's a line of division that we can't even find within us. Where do we, where does our spirit and our soul come together within our own lives? We don't know. I know there are people that sit around and they think their spirit, they're, they try to have these spiritual experiences and things, but we can't really define the difference between our soul, our thinking apparatus, and our spirit. And yet, the word of God can divide the two. 
It says it can separate the joints and dig the marrow out of the bones. That's really what it's telling us. Uh, I, I've heard explanations there, you know, talking about like a steak knife, what you can do with it, and it can really do some of these things, but it, it has to do really with what's within us. It can get all the way through us can separate the joints and dig the marrow out of the bones. It knows the difference between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Isn't it wonderful? As long as God is doing it, you know, we get upset when uh, we see some of the things that uh, our computers know about us. But uh, when it comes to God, we might as well just throw up our hands and realize he knows it all. He knows it all. So you see what's included when it says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's that word of God that's going to give us faith because we're going to learn more about him. It's only through hearing what's in God's word that we can be saved. It's only through God's word that we can develop faith. And of course, it's through that faith that we're saved to begin with. And we find that in God's word. We see Romans 4, 5, but to him that does not work, but the believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We can go to 2 Timothy 3, 15, from a child you've been taught the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation for through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, faith. Even Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's showing you what faith is and it's building that faith up within you. Now we could go on looking at these things. There are loads of verses that we could go through that talk about all of these things that we can learn from God's word and that will build up our faith. And uh, it's the word of God is living and it's powerful and it can divide the soul from the spirit of man and so on. Well, we see how, how all of that works. Now, we started this morning in Hebrews 11. For the next few minutes, we want to look at three men that are mentioned here in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And we want to see what they learned. We want to see how it progressed in their actions. And we want to see how it can apply to our Christian lives. Now, the first one we want to look at is the first one here, Abel. And we don't know much about Abel. But I think that there are a few things that we can assume here about Abel. In Hebrews 11.4 here, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead still speaks. Now, we mentioned that word from Romans that told us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, Abel must have heard the word of God. God gave it to him and uh, he knew what God wanted, didn't he? And he knew what God wanted. Shouldn't it be safe to assume that Cain heard too? Well, I think so. He didn't talk to just one of these or reveal this to just one of these brothers. They both knew. But obviously with Cain, there was no response. If we go back to Genesis, the, the chapter here in, in Genesis 4, uh, we find uh, that it brings out a little more about these brothers. In Genesis 4, 3, it says, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So here we see that, here we read that God respected Abel and his offering. Why? Well, we have God's way of bringing an offering to him, which Abel took. And we have man's way, 
which Cain took. Now, God said, bring an offering. And he told him what he wanted, obviously. But we see that anything else, it had to come from the imagination of the heart. And one was taken and was expected, and one was not. Now, when it comes to this, uh, we see that God respected his offering. Uh, really, respect here, it means to hold in high, on high or to hold in special regard. And uh, we find that uh, that's what God is talking about here. He just did not regard Cain's offering as worth anything. And, uh, of course, it made Cain upset. God said, bring an offering. Why didn't he? Now, quest, one of the questions we could have today is, to what will God have respect? God certainly doesn't want to sacrifice today. We don't live in that day and age. But, you know, if you were talking about, we, we, we think about the Samaritan woman in John, the fourth chapter, and God told her, Christ told her, he said, God is a spirit, and those that worship him in spirit, those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, then he adds, important line, he said, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. What does that mean to us? It means that if we're going to worship God, we must do it in the spirit. God has made our spirit alive by putting his spirit within us, and uh, we must worship him through that spirit. Uh, we can go to uh, Romans, the eighth chapter, Romans 8, 5. And in Romans 8, 5, it says, uh, for those... For those who living, live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those that live according to the Spirit on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. It says that in the flesh we cannot please God. We can only come to him through the spirit that he's put within us. It's interesting here. Uh, I note that when he talked to, when Christ talked to the lady of Samaria there, the word spirit was small s. When Paul writes it here, the spirit is capital S. So it's, it's of course, talking to, about the Holy Spirit that's within us, that's within our spirit, that's given life to our spirit. Uh, I think that's probably an interesting thing to study, something that we can give some thought to at some point, but uh, probably deeper than we want to go today. But anyway, we find the, how this is all put together and works. Now, in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, we see contra contrasted here the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. So in Galatians 5.17. He says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. First, it points out this conflict between the flesh and the spirit. Now, we sometimes call it the old man versus the new man. We get that from the book of Romans, where he talks about the old nature and the new nature. And uh, it's, it is a conflict that goes on in each and one, every one of our lives. That's what Paul was writing about. He was complaining, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do. It has to do with this conflict that's going on continually in our lives. Uh, so that's what this is pointing out. In the next few verses here in Galatians, of course, it talks about the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit. And, of course, it gives us the good works that are of the Spirit, where it says the works fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
and so on. Uh, and then, of course, it gives us the fruit uh, of the uh, flesh, which, of course, is envy, murder, drunkenness, and all these. It goes on and on. It's a bad list. So you have the good list and the bad list. But, of course, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit of God that he works within us. Very important. Anyway, it says here in verse 11, or in Hebrews 11, it talks about the fact that Abel was in agreement with God on what he should do. And he was in agreement by faith. Now, let's go on to the next man that we're going to look at. And of course, that is the next one here. It has to do with uh, Enoch. Enoch. Now, Enoch is, Enoch is another man here in the scripture that we don't see very much about other than in Hebrews and uh, here and then he's mentioned in two other places only. And let's look at the first of those, which is back over in Genesis uh, 5, in Genesis 5, 21. These first few pages are harder to get to than some of the rest of them. In Genesis 5, 21, it tells us more about Enoch. Uh, it starts there, Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. After he begat Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So we have this, this verse here, these verses that tell us a little bit about Methuselah. Actually, if you go to verse 18, it says that Jared lived 300 years, uh, uh, or Jared lived 162 years and begat Enoch. And uh, so we know that he had a father there in that list. But we, uh, as we see, the important thing was that he had this son, Methuselah, and then 300 more years he lived on the earth and he begat sons and daughters. But very interesting. And uh, we see that his total days on earth were only 365 because back before the flood, they seemed to live on and on and on. And uh, yet uh, his, he wasn't around that long. Finally, it says Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Well, what does that mean? I guess it means just what he says. First rapture, he took him away. He took him away. Now, this covers his time on earth. His first son's birth and 300 years of a walk with God. Then he was gone because God took him. Notice that after God took him, his father lived 500 more years. And his eldest son, Methuselah, he lived 669 more years. Interesting. You know, after all my years in... Sunday school and listening to preachers of one kind and another. I had never until just very recently, last month or so, I had never, was never aware of the fact that there was a great conflict over whether Enoch died or not. There are those that say, well, it says in, you know, Hebrews eleven fourteen, 14, it says all these died in the faith and he's listed there. So he died in the faith with the rest of them. Yeah, well, that's it's not quite what it says. I, I think there's a lot more to it than that. I never, never heard of that. Never, never came to be. But the more I was reading it, why it acted like it was a big deal in the church. I don't know, but uh, interesting. Anyway, take it from me. God raptured him, took him to heaven, didn't die. Okay. Anyway. Uh, we have one other passage that tells us a little bit about Enoch, and that's in the book of Jude. Now, it's in Jude. Jude is that little book that they stick right in there in front of Revelation. Real small book. We're going to read the 14th chapter of the book of Jude here. It says here, now Enoch 
the seventh from Adam, prophesied about those men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I'm getting behind on these. You that are out there waiting for it to come up on your screen, I'm a, I'm a little behind pushing the button, but you just have to forgive me on that. But anyway, this is an interesting, uh, these are interesting verses. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, it says he prophesied about these things. And uh, he's prophesying here about the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. Now, if you went back in this passage, there's some interesting things in this passage. He's talking here, I think this is probably a, a twofold prophecy. One is a prophecy of judgment that's going to come uh, when he was prophesying about judgment to come. He was probably talking about the flood, but he's also talking about judgment to come there in the end time, because that's how these verses end up. But if we went back to the fifth or the, well, the eighth verse here, it says he's talking about these men, which that's all he calls them is these men. But he says, likewise, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority. They speak evil of dignitaries. Yet it says, Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed for the body of Moses, dared not bring a riling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in the things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and have run greedily in the area error of Balaam for the prophet, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Well, of course, he's going through some Old Testament stories here. But then he gets down to this, what it said that we read here about uh, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and uh, how he uh, prophesied. And uh, it talks about... Uh, it, Christ coming back with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all. And uh, so he's, he's talking here about his saints. I think we really were told that we should have, it should be translated, it shouldn't be saints. It's holy ones. And uh, it could be translated that or his angels, because really it's talking about Revelation 19 where the rider on the white horse comes back with the armies of heaven behind him. And uh, that's, uh, that's really what that's about. But uh, anyway, there's something I've always wondered about that, that passage I just read to you. I kind of, kind of accidentally got it in there, but it has to do with uh, Michael contending with Satan over the body of Moses. Uh, you know, I, what comes to my mind real quick comes to my mind, I can see this, this Jewish family sitting around there and the 13 and 14 year old boys get to talking about the Sabbath, the Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath school class they'd had that morning and the teacher had been teaching them about uh, the Moses and the fact that God hid his body and they couldn't find his body, even though they went out and looked for it and uh, all of this. And I can just see these, these boys sitting down there, the, this family in Judea, and uh, Jesus being one of them with his brothers there. And one of his brothers is talking about, oh, maybe we should go look for that. We, that would be wonderful. We could find the body of Moses. It's not too far from here. Oh, wait, you know how little boys talk. They get into these things and they just see Jesus saying, oh, no, no point looking. Michael went and got it. It's just one of those things, you know. It's, just one of those things. How did Jude know that? That's what, that's what came to my mind. Yeah, not bad. Anyway, Jude tell, tells us that he prophesied to the false teachers of his day. And Genesis tells us that he walked with God. Now we know that he prophesied the coming judgment of the Lord because he named his son Methuselah. Now loosely speaking, uh, that... Methuselah means when he is dead, when he is dead, then it shall come to pass. And 
So we named his son when he is dead, it shall come to pass. And if you do the math in all those passages there in Genesis where it talks about the genealogies up to Noah, you'll see that the judgment came the year that Methuselah died. And so there was, there was a, a meaning in that. It meant that God's judgment would come. Now, Methuselah. Methuselah is a wonderful example of God's mercy. After the prophecy was made, God caused him to live longer than any other man, any other person on earth. We find God's judgment waited, and it waited, and it waited. In fact, First Peter tells us how divine, how the divine long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. The, that's what Peter says in, in Second Peter, uh, or First Peter, I guess it is. But anyway, he talks about the long-suffering of God waiting in the days of Noah. Well, that's important too. Uh, we find then in, uh, as this verse came out, we find that uh, by faith, Enoch was taken away, that he did not see death. But there's a verse after that, the sixth verse. But with faith, it is, with faith, it is, impossible. I'm looking at that and I think that's wrong. It's by without faith, it is impossible. With, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Well, I changed the meaning of that, didn't I, by leaving out a word, or leaving out part of a word. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Verse 5 didn't say anything about faith here, but verse 6 does. Now, if we don't believe God, we can't not please God. It's only by faith that we can find God. So we find the wonderful things that faith will do for us. Now we're going to come to the third person that we're going to look at here, and that is Noah. We find in Hebrews eleven seven. 7, one verse about Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of the household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. One verse about Noah, but it tells us so much, so much. It tells us that he came to God by faith. It tells us uh, that it means that he came in God's way, of course. It tells us that he walked with God and that God spoke to him in warning. It tells us that he acted on God's warning. It tells us that he was a witness for God. It tells us that he was declared righteousness because of his faith. Now we think of uh, Righteousness by faith, starting with Abraham, but actually God was always dealing with man, giving him righteousness with, by faith. He had Abel's faith. He was in agreement with God. He had Enoch's faith. He walked with God. But you know, if you consider here, he was called upon to believe God and to believe in matters that were never before spoken of. He was called on him to act on what he believed. He had to do something. He built a ship. Well, that's all you can call it. It was too big to hide. Everybody saw it. I would bet anything it was out there in the field somewhere, a long way from any water that would float it. But he built it there. Did everybody see it? Absolutely, because it says that by it, he condemned the world. It was his testimony out there, and by it he condemned the world. We know that he preached to them. Second Peter tells us that. Second Peter says that they had fair warning for the judgment to come, 
what is it, Second Peter 2, 5. God did not spare the angels of sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them to chains of darkness, to be reserved for judgment. And he says, and he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And he was, a, he, through what he did, he condemned the world. Now all of these men were in agreement with God. They were in agreement by faith. Not their way, but his way. These men all walked with God by faith. And they walked by God in his way, not their way. These men all witnessed for God by faith. They witnessed in his way, not their way. Paul tells us we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, we need that faith. We were all saved by faith. We all walk with God in this life by faith. We face the end of this life by faith. We wait to be called to our heavenly home by faith. Faith, the substance of things hoped for. The substance of that which we're looking forward to. Because we've been promised it by a God who cannot lie. Well, we're thankful for God's word and for what he tells us in it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promises that you've given us. Oh Lord, yes, we believe. Help, help our unbelief. Lord, help us. Build us up in the faith. Guide and direct. Now help this week. We commit our way to you. We're thankful for all that you do for us. In Jesus' blessed name we ask it. Amen.